Thanks for joining us. For more great content like this, visit polishingthepulpit.com or search for Polishing the Pulpit in your favorite podcast app. Also, be sure to check out PTP365 for thousands of more videos just like this. You can learn more by visiting 365.polishingthepulpit.com, and to make it easy for you, we've put a link in this video's description. Let's sing a song and study together. Good morning, ladies. Welcome to another Ladies' Day hosted by Polishing the Pulpit. And today, our topic is going to center around a verse in Acts 13, verse 22, and I'm calling it A Woman After God's Own Heart. I know it doesn't say that, but that's where I got my idea for this lesson. And I've tried to put together a lot of different topics that we as women deal with in our lives on a, on a daily basis. And I hope that something that I say today will be um, helpful to you. I know these are the things that I keep in front of me and I pray about. Psalm 139, 23 says, Search my heart. O oh God, and know my heart, try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. There are so many things that want our attention these days. There's the TV ad that says, if you'll buy this product and use it for 15 minutes a day, you too can look like that model. There's the boss who really wishes that you would come in a little earlier and stay a little later, and he's really sorry that he can't give you that raise this year again. There are the gutters that are falling off the house because they have trees growing in them, and there's a stack of bills that's a little bit more than the stack of money that's in the checking account. We've got so many things that require our attention today. And if you're married, for those of you who are married, there's the husband who really needs his best white shirt for the meeting in the morning. He can't find his keys again. Would you help with that? And there may be these little people or the getting bigger people who live with you, and they need attention every single second. And you know what I'm talking about when I say you can't even go to the bathroom and have any peace because you shut the door and 30 seconds later, Mom, are you in there? And there's these little fingers coming in through the bat under the bathroom door. Yes, I am in here with your fingers, trying to get some peace. And so we're really, we're really torn in this life that we live for things that need attention. Do we have the characteristics that it can be said that we're a woman after God's own heart? What what does that even mean? You know, when it talks, Scripture talks about the heart 833 times. Heart is mentioned in the Scripture, and zero, none of those are pertaining to that blood-pumping organ that is going on right now without you even thinking about it. Heart in Scripture refers to your mind. That's the heart. And because God knows that whenever you give your mind, give your heart to Him, give your mind to Him, He knows that you will follow Him into life everlasting. But there's another being that knows the same exact thing. Satan, the devil, Beelzebub, the prince of this world, he also knows that if he can talk you into giving him your mind, that you will also follow after him. Only you'll follow him to your own destruction. Beginning in the Old Testament, we read where God, our God, is a jealous God. He wants all of your attention. Yes, all of your heart. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. So whatever we give our minds to, that's what owns us. And as Christians, I wonder if we give that any thought. Well, I'm pretty sure that if we thought about what does it take to say, to have someone say about me that I'm a woman after God's own heart. Well, I'm pretty sure it would involve the fruits of the Spirit found in Galatians. That would be love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I'm pretty sure all of those things would be one of the characteristics. But what is it that gets our attention every day? And again, I'm referring to the verses in Acts 13, 22, and 3, and it says this. This is why I named it this. 
And when he, God, had removed him, Saul, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony, and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart which shall fulfill all my will. And of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised unto Israel a Savior, Jesus. So we learn several things from just those two verses. Number one, we learn that David will be the king to take Saul's place. He didn't want them to have a king, but since they insisted, he gave them a king. And when Saul displeased God in many ways, He raised up David. So David was going to be the king. And number two, it says through David's lineage, Jesus will be born, fulfilling many prophecies. David, number three, was a man after God's own heart. We decided that the heart is the mind. Now, we all know David's story. It's recorded for us. Saul the king was chosen, but he chose the wrong path. His ego, his pride... He got away from God, and then a godly person, Samuel, was chosen to go to Saul and say these words in 1 Saul 13, verse 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. And the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. There it is again. And the Lord hath commanded him to be the captain over the people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. David, the shepherd boy, was chosen by God to be the king in Saul's place. And out of all of his brothers, in 1 Samuel 16, 7, David was not even there, and he was the one chosen. Remember the parade of the brothers, Jesse's sons? Following, the Lord told Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his statue, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. He knew David's mind, and he knew he had uh, a mind to go after the things that pleased God. What made David a man after God's own heart? And can we look at those same characteristics and understand what we need to do to be known as a woman after God's own heart? Well, if you know the story, He wasn't where he should have been, and I guess if she's bathing on the roof, neither was she. The Bible says, at a time when kings go, David sent. He should have been out in the battlefield at the time with his army, but he wasn't. He was at home in idle time. He looked, he lusted, he lingered, he lied, and then he lost at the end of it all. He thought he hid it. Uriah, he had Uriah come from the battlefield. He said, hey, go on down to your house, you know, see your wife, kiss the babies, you know, have a good dinner. Mm -mm, He wouldn't. He said, how can I do that when all my comrades are out in the field fighting? So he wouldn't do it. David got him drunk. Maybe I can get him to go home then. Nope. He slept at the king's door instead of going on down to his house. I think it's ironic that a drunk Uriah was in more control than a sober David. But that's what happened. And he committed murder. He sent Uriah back with his own death warrant in his hand. A trustworthy servant he treated like this to cover up what he had done. And in the end, when he thought he hid it, he was confronted by another godly person, Nathan this time. And he repented in verse 13. In 2 Samuel 12, Nathan was a hero. He was a great gospel preacher. He was unafraid, no hesitation whatsoever. He told God's word boldly. He told David about a little ewe lamb that this family had that they treated like their daughter, and he ate from their table. Next door lived a wealthy family, a wealthy man who had flocks and herds galore, and he had company. And instead of using one of those, he went next door and he got that family's little ewe lamb and he cooked him up for supper for his guests. Well, David was a shepherd. His heart broke. He was was irate, angry at what this man had done. Well, sometimes we're like David. We can easily see the sins of other people. Not so easy to see the sins ourselves. And David paid the consequences for years. Can you imagine how his blood ran cold when Nathan said, thou art the man? He probably put a finger in his face and said, you're mad about that? You're the one. You're the man. 
David paid dearly. The sword never left his house. He never got to build the tabernacle, the temple, like he wanted to. He lost four sons because he said, the man that did this shall repay fourfold. Well, he lost four sons in all of that, including the baby that came from the union of he and Bathsheba. So many consequences just for a night's pleasure. See, pride is at the basis of most sins. Pride takes God off the throne. We despise God when we sin. We say, well, I know what your word says, God. I know that that's a warning that you have for me, but I've got this. I know what I'm doing. David never knew peace, and I think the worst thing about it, his conscience, his memory, his heart, probably never let him forget that. It's the same with us. Secret sins haunt us forever. Um, it's best not to do them in the first place. If we can ever talk, um, I want to say, young people into not doing things, but then we as older adults, we mess up just as often, if not more. You can get forgiveness. You can clean it up between you and God. Any sin is forgiven, but the scar is always there. When uh, Eddie and I worked uh, at a, the first place after he got out of school, um, there was a young boy there who had messed around with LSD and a lot of uh, hallucinogenic drugs. And he would be at church, and he would just be the best Christian you've ever seen. And then three months later, he would disappear. And we'd go get him, and eventually he would come back, and he would repent, and he would, again, be very strong and vocal and a leader, and then he'd disappear. And this was sort of a routine with him. He's really struggled with the drugs that he had messed his mind up with. And one day he came and told Eddie, he said, I've gotten a new job in California. And Eddie said, oh, well, that's great. He said, I I'm really glad to hear that. I hope you enjoy it. How long will you be gone? He said, well, I'll be gone about six months. I'll come back and tell you about it when I get back. Eddie said, please do. I'm interested. So he came back in six months, and Eddie was really glad to see him and came into his office and sat down and began to tell him about some of the things. And I remember he, he said he went out on a bus. He'd never been to that part of the country, and so he rode a bus. And at one stop, somewhere in the mid-Arizona, somewhere out west, a young girl about his age, in, in his late 20s, got on the bus and sat down beside him. And they began to talk about their backgrounds and where they lived and their interests. And eventually the subject of religion came up. Tony told her that he was a member of the Church of Christ, and he asked her if she had ever uh, heard of that, and she hadn't. And he said, well, what church are you a member of? And he said that she rolled up her sleeve and revealed a hideous scar, self-inflicted, as a member of the Church of Satan. She'd been a member of the Church of Satan. And as they began to speak, she told him that she'd gotten out of the Church of Satan, but this stuck with me. He said, I'm glad to say that she's no longer a member of the Church of Satan, but the scar is still there. You know, some of the sins that we can commit and the, the roads that we go down and we do wrong, we can get forgiveness and we can come back. But many times we bear the consequences of those sins for years, possibly the rest of our life. It's a serious thing. Those things will always be with us. And thinking about David, maybe David was known as a man after God's own heart because he was chosen to bear the lineage that would one day bring Jesus into the world. I don't know. Maybe David was known as a man after God's own heart because he accepted his mistakes. When Nathan said, thou art the man, he owned it. He didn't blame it on anybody else. And he wanted to do things God's way. Well, what about us? What about us in similar situations? You know, in David's um, situation, a life had to be sacrificed because of that sin. David and Bathsheba were not stoned as the law demanded. Their lives were not taken, and they should have been according to the law. Why? Well, the law demanded a life be taken for this type of sexual sin, and David and Bathsheba's baby son, his innocent life was taken, sacrificed, instead of David's. The baby's life was taken to pay for David's sin. See, God has an overall plan, and that overall plan takes precedence over the weakness of man. The prophecy that Jesus would come into the world as a baby 
and would be born in the city of David, born in the house of David. Many, many prophecies throughout the Old Testament saying that he would come from the lineage of David. And every Jewish girl dreamed that she would be the virgin that would bring forth, that God chose to bring his son into the world and save the people from their sins. This was going to happen. Now, what to do about the sin? So David's life went on, but he paid a dear, dear price for his sin, and so did Bathsheba. I mean, just the knowledge that their baby boy lay dying because of what he had done. And yet somehow, David knew that it was possible for him to see that baby son again. He said in verse 20, Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his apparel and came into the house of the Lord and worshipped. And then he came into his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him, and he did eat. Interesting that later his son Solomon had a heart problem. In 1 Kings eleven four, it says, And for when it came to pass, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. Did that just say David's heart was perfect? I know one thing, God has a heart for us. I think it's interesting, if you put two ears together, they form a heart, sort of. And then if you write the word heart, H-E-A-R-T, what are the three letters right in the middle? E-A-R, ear. And when you put two ears together, you get a picture of a heart. If you love someone, you're going to have time to listen to them. Loving God's the same. If we truly love God, we have a heart for God, then we're going to want to listen to what he has to say. How do we do that? God speaks to us through his word. So it just depends on the amount of time and effort that we put each week into studying God's word and putting it in our heart. Listen obey, live, repeat. You know, if we have a heart for God, we will love him, the Bible says in John 14, 15. If we have a heart for God, we'll be faithful to him, Matthew 6, 33 and 34, which happens to be my favorite verse because I think if you get the seek ye first the kingdom of God in the right order, I think everything else will fall into place. And we will obey him. We have a heart for God when we want to obey him, Acts 5, 29. Is having an obedient heart one of the ways in which we become a woman after God's own heart? Is trusting God with the heart of unquestioning loyalty how we become a woman after God's own heart? Well, let's see about that. How do we become this woman after God's own heart? I wanted to share our P's and Q's, and I was going to make everything start with a P and a Q, but they all start with a P. Sorry, couldn't find any Q's. So we'll be watching our P's. Number one, if you're taking notes, there's probably about seven um, points that I have. And so the first one is P, prepare for the fight. Now, what fight? You know, if you're ever in any kind of struggle or fight, you need to know your enemy. The Bible says that the devil is like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That word devour means eat, chew up tear, destroy. Our enemy knows our weaknesses. He knew Job's weaknesses, but Job never wavered. Do you know there's a war going on today in 2020 in our American culture? There's a war going on with you simply because you are a Christian woman. The war on women, better known as feminism, is a huge part of the New Age movement. And we're going to have to get this one right. I chose this one as the first one because you're going to have to get this one right, I know for sure, in order to be a woman after God's own heart. Feminism is part of that New Age movement you may have heard about. And it's a movement that began in the 50s and 60s. I was born in 62, and so hot pants and independent and working women, that was all sort of going on when I was a young person. And then in my teen years, it took root. The Equal Rights Amendment was passed, and no one in my family or even in my city, the group that I was raised by, my village, no one could believe that abortion was legalized. And 
They had no way of knowing the damage and the destruction that it would leave in its wake. But this is all, this was all brought on by the movement known as feminism. And they are alive and well today. Let me tell you about feminism. If you think feminism is just being feminine, that's not it. There's something deeper here. And if any feminists are listening to me teach this lesson, their head's going to blow off before I get off of this first topic. Feminism believes that a woman is superior to a man and that women are a lot more important in our culture than the man. Feminism is not content, and they will never be content, until they have wiped off the face of the earth, every tenant of Christianity, and the strong women that hold fast to God's will for their lives. Feminists hate a strong, confident Christian woman. Doesn't go along with their narrative, and they get in the way. Feminists are not submissive to any man, even and especially God. I was recommended, uh, the book, The Shack, was recommended to me very highly by two or three people that I should read this. I tried on two separate occasions. I never could get past it. Never finished it. Because in the book and what happened in The Shack, God was portrayed as a woman. I just, I couldn't get past it. Somebody said, well, keep reading. You'll understand, you know, why I couldn't do it. I put it down. I just said I can't do it. What is God's plan? In Ephesians 5, verse 6, it says, And let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. In Ephesians 5, 22, it says, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and he is the savior of the body. Okay, right now, feminist heads blow off. They don't want to hear that. But yet, that's been in the scripture and that's the word of God. That's God's authority speaking. I'm all for having an open mind, but some folks have such an open mind, their brains have fallen off the side of their head. There's shows that I see these, I, I just, we just were watching one last night. In both scenes when the police, the male and the female police, went to the door of the suspect, the woman just threw her leg up there and kicked the door in. We can't do that. There might be one woman in the United States that can do that because they've trained to do that. We're, our bodies are not built that way. Men are built, and it's supposed to be that way. Why do you think they're doing that with female cops on the shows? Because we've got to show that you are superior to the male. You can do anything that the man can do. And that the man is not in the head of you or in charge of the situation in any way. That's what it teaches. You know, culture changes, and sometimes those changes are good, but we need to be careful not to change God's law if we want to be a woman after God's own heart. Can women be doctors and lawyers and teachers and Indian chiefs? Yes. Can women decide, unlike some cultures, what clothing they're going to wear that day? Yes, with God's approval. Can women decide whether or not their unborn baby lives or dies? Emphatically, no. We've killed 60 million of our most innocent citizens in this country since 1971 Roe v. Wade became law. And they told us that it's a mass of tissue. They told us it's my body and I can do what I want to with it. They told us that abortions will decrease. They'll go down if you'll legalize them. Well, technology today with 3D images, it shows us it is not a mass of tissue. It is a baby that's wonderfully made by God. And it's not your baby. It's not your body. It's the baby's body that we're talking about. Do I need to draw a picture like your body, the baby's body? There's two bodies here. A woman who has an abortion does not become unpregnant. She becomes the mother of a dead child. And I am so hopeful that with the generation that we have coming up, and our generation that one day we can turn this around. Abortion has gone through the roof, and we are now using it as a way to control reproduction. It's become legal in several states to murder your child up until the day of birth. 
And I even heard my own governor of Virginia, a medical doctor, sit on a radio program and tell if the baby was born and the mother didn't want it, then she and the doctor would make a decision about how they were going to do this, and they would keep the baby comfortable until they did so. I was mortified. We have to change this. But feminists are the front of this movement, and when our Lord returns, I don't want to find myself aligned with this group in any way. Now, here's what feminism is why I bring up this point in the first place. It's how it affects our homes. See, we can be fooled and tricked into thinking that following feminism is a good thing. You know, Satan knows how to use people, and he knows how to color things so that, eh, that sounds okay. Feminism, that sounds okay. But in Hebrews 13, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. What God has thought about this topic and others, it does not change, and it will not change. God hasn't changed what he wants from his people. In verse 9, Hebrews 13, 9 says, Be not carried about with diverse and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace the heart. We got to know what we believe and why we believe so that we know the decisions, what's right and wrong. We know how we stand on those things. See, feminism, another thing they're about is they're all about gender neutrality. And these people that want to make their sons a daughter and change their daughters into a son, they're feminists. They all are. They're for labeling the sexes as X on a birth certificate and then letting the baby decide later which gender he or she is. It's, It's ludicrous. I was walking across campus uh, after a a college class, and I was uh, teaching a class, and I was with another person who was teaching a class. So we were adults in our 50s, and we were talking about um, how we handed out lots of materials when we were teaching middle and and, uh, elementary school. And I told about something that I did, and this method worked well. And so she said, how did you manage all of those materials? I mean, the markers and the Kleenex and the boards and with a class every time coming in and out. And I said, well, usually I would tell the boys, I would say, boys, go get a marker, Kleenex and a board for yourself and one for a girl and then hand that out on your way back to your seat. We'll teach, you know, teaching manners, teaching, trying to teach them manners, waiting on a woman. And her response was, Having the boys always get the materials, that's not very gender neutral. I said, I wasn't trying to be gender neutral. I'm trying to teach these boys how to get along and and live and be happy once they get a wife. Uh, She didn't really appreciate my humor or the fact that I didn't get it. Oh, I get it all right. I got it then and I get it now what the goal is with gender neutrality. There's two from the beginning. There's always been two and there's still two. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 11 through 15, it says, among other things, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection, but I suffer not a woman to teach, nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed and then Eve. See, that's the buzzword for feminism today, gender neutral. Think New York has 31 genders. Male and female come in at like 17 and 18 on their list. Uh, but the thing is, there's only been two put on a birth certificate so far. Somebody better put it in drive instead of neutral. That's not happening. We're different. Men and women are different. That's the way God made us. In Genesis, see, Eve decided that she would do something. She made a decision for her home that was not hers to make. Oh, Adam sinned just as much. He wasn't being who he should have been either. But she decided that I'd like to regulate what's good and evil. I I think we should do this. And she gave it to him and he ate. God has order. God has order in nature. God has order with us. God has order in the church and worship. And if we're to be a woman after God's own heart, we have to live like we realize that God made men and women different. We all have a role to play in this. The reason I made this number one is that I see dangers out there at my age that I want to warn others about. Feminism is a fight for your soul. And it's a fight that you're going to have to win if you want to be a woman after God's own heart. It's about heaven. That's the reason to bring it up at all. And how we prepare for the fight depends on, and it determines whether or not we have a heart for God. So prepare for the fight. And number two, pick your priorities. 
How we prioritize our time every day, I think, says whether or not we have a heart for God. You know, the time is the same for all of us. We have the same time. Some people seem to get so much done in the same amount of time as I have. You know, there's 60 minutes in an hour, and there's 24 hours in a day, and there's 168 hours in a week, and 8,736 hours in a year. We all have the same. What does our heart for God say about what we do every day, how we spend our time? Planning is the key. I used to have a sign up in my sixth grade classroom And, you know, when things were due, then all of a sudden we had an emergency and we all needed to go call our mothers to bring our project that we hadn't planned and and brought to school. And I wouldn't let them go call because I wanted to see the I wanted them to see the urgency of them taking care of themselves. So the sign said, lack of planning on your part does not constitute an emergency on my part. You know, there has to be some time in this busy, busy world in our American culture that we just sit down, we stop frequently and take inventory of our progress and rearrange our priorities if necessary. You know, like when was the first, the last time that you thought about when you prayed, where you prayed, how much you prayed? When's the last time you thought about your Bible study? What were you studying? Where were you this time last year? And have you done anything or set any goals, created any activity that'll make you be in a different part this time next year? Have you found a new project at church to direct your energies. When's the last time that you took a good, hard look at your giving and thought about ways to increase your giving? You know, our money is not for God. He doesn't need our money. But it's what it's what it says about our heart. What does our giving say about us? If we don't continually manage these things and lots of others and strive to be a woman after God's own heart, we're going to be in the same exact place next year. We'll grow old and we'll look back and say, where did the time go? Why didn't I do more with what I had? No one ever said on their deathbed, "Mm, I wish I had worked some more. I wish I had put in an extra hour of work every week. Nobody ever said that. Proverbs 4.23 says, Keep thy heart heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You know, it's like that with anything. What we honor and what we truly value, we're going to give time to that. We just are. We have the same amount of time. We make time for the things that we want to do. If you ever hear somebody say, Oh, I'm sorry, I just didn't have time to do that. More than likely, it just wasn't on the top of their list. So there's our time, first of all. Sometimes it's about the time we used. You know, Mary and Martha made choices about what they were doing with their time. I think the the answer there was when given the choice between work and worship, God wants us to choose worship every time. Sometimes it's about the time we wasted. I, I, I don't even want to know how many hours that we put into sports, watching sports and taking our children to sports and being a part of sports compares to our prayer and our Bible study. It probably would make us sad, but I think that's probably something we need to do. What's the big picture? Does this, my being in this sport or this drama or this, you know, whatever activity I'm in, does this fit in my life or does it trump everything else that I'm doing? And this is all of a sudden my number one. You know, there's games on the phone that are such a waste of time. Facebook can become, you know, obsessive and just checking it all the time. How much time does your Facebook and your games and your TV shows take up that you could be doing something for the kingdom of God? Who owns our heart? Ecclesiastes 8, 5 says, Whoso keepeth the commandments shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. So there's our time. And number two, there's our wealth. Believe me, you are wealthy. If you had the money and the transportation to come here and go to church and go to youth things and just show up, you are wealthier than 90% of the world's population. You are. What we honor and we give time to, that's That says what we value. You can watch a person and see what they value, really. 
We all need money to live in the world, but if there was anything that you have that you wouldn't give it away if you had to, then it owns you. You don't own it. And we can get out of out of whack with our possessions sometimes. First Timothy 6, 8 and following talks about that. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money, not money, for the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some have coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. We can value that too much. Proverbs 23, 5 says, For riches certainly made themselves wings, they fly away as an eagle toward heaven. In the years of children, I remember thinking, my money does have wings, it just flies out the door, because I get it and it's gone, because there's always something that they need. So there's our time that we should prioritize, there's our wealth, and number three, our Bible study. First Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is within you with meekness and fear. What are our spiritual goals? Um, it could be, I don't know the books of the Bible, so I need to memorize the books of the Bible in order. Maybe that's a goal, but it, we need to set a goal and say a time limit. Day on the calendar. By this time, I'm going to work and memorize the books of the Bible. Maybe another good goal would be I want to read a lady's spiritual book every month, uh, every other month. We have some of the greatest, um, most spiritually minded women authors in the church. And I can never seem to be reading every book that I want to when another one comes out. That's a good goal to have. Maybe you think, well, I want to become a teacher. I want to teach a children's class. I want to teach one women's class. That's just a goal of mine. We've, we've got to balance everything we do. We've got to balance our time. We can't just focus on one thing and just do that. We have to make time for Bible study and work, whatever that is, exercise, whatever that is, uh, socializing and church work. Balance is like, see, you can be busy. Busy doesn't mean we're working for God and pleasing for Him. You can be busy at church work and still not be doing what God wants. Sometimes it's an excuse. You know, Martha was very busy, but Jesus taught her in that snapshot we have that she was not choosing wisely. Number four, we have to prioritize our decisions. Proverbs 4, 7 says, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. And verse 12 says, Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ears to the words of knowledge. See, if we decide, that's one of our decisions, if we decide, I'm a Christian, church is first, everything else fits around that, you're going to save yourself a lot of time trying to decide what you're going to do, whether you're going to go to this gospel meeting on Friday night, or whether you're going to go to sports and miss something else, or a practice. Um, I'll tell you a little story about us. We had a a coach in our life who we thought the world of. He was so good to our child. And this is in middle school and high school. So good to, to and this coach came to one of our children's weddings. Um, just had a really good relationship. But once upon a time, the devil tried to get in the Gilpins with this coach. Um, my child's senior year, and he was really really good at this sport. He set seven records for the state that are still on the, the record board now, many years later. He was really good at this sport. And his senior year, this coach, who we really loved, went around to each boy when they were at practice and told him of the goals that he wanted for them. Now, up until this time, I wasn't very popular when the pitcher had to come off the mound at 15 till 7 because it was almost time for church and I had to pick him up and get him to the building. I was not popular. I was not popular when he could not attend Wednesday night games because there again were there. When they played on Sunday morning in a tournament and we were at worship only to come back and find out they lost two and we went home. But that's okay. 
But this coach, his goal for my child for his senior year was, I want you to be a leader. You're the leadoff battle, the leader. I really think we can win state championship this year. I want you to be at every game, even those Wednesday night games. Well, that upset him, the child, and he came home. I said, don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. We'll go talk to him. Don't worry. Don't worry about a thing. Um, it kind of aggravated Eddie um, because we had, this was not something new. We've been doing this the whole time since he was in middle school. We went and talked to him, and we said, we appreciate how you've dealt with him. He thinks the world of you. We understand what your goal is for him, but we're here to tell you that he cannot give that to you because the decision as to where that child will be on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and every gospel meeting and every youth activity and everything else that goes on at the church building, we're going to be there first. He cannot be at the Wednesday night games, and he has no control over that. It's our decision, our decision that we made even before he was born. And, of course, the, the coach may not have understood, but he said he did. And he knew and he could see the um, that we had made up our mind about that. And he was very cordial about it. I'll give him that. But what happens when somebody draws a line and says, you have to be here. You have to do that. You can miss church one time or another. Mm -mm. No, see, we already made that decision. So when those things come up, they're much easier to know what we're going to do. What does our empty seat say about us when we just decide one Wednesday night or one Sunday night or Sunday morning that we're just not coming? What does our empty seat say about us? In 1 Samuel 20, verse 18, Jonathan said to David, Tomorrow is the new moon, and thou shalt be missed, because thy seat will be empty. What does that seat say about you when you don't show up to encourage and edify your brothers and sisters, and then you're not there to keep your fire lit, to know how to go out into the world and transform people with the gospel? See, Joseph, in Genesis 39, he already made up his mind. A long time before he needed to make up his mind. You know what I mean? So in Genesis 39, verses 7 through 20, he already put God first. So there he is, a young man treated terribly by his brothers, sold to some merchants. He finds himself in a strange place. Now, that would have been just the place to say, nobody's here, nobody's going to know whatever I do, so I'm just going to do what I want to do. That's If anybody was ever going to do that, that's the situation. But that's not what Joseph did. He said, God's number one. I have a heart for him. And it's more important to please God than to please anybody else. He wanted to keep his heart pure. And when Mrs. Potiphar approached him out of the blue, he already made up his mind. I hate that happened to him, and he probably hated being put in that situation, and he was punished for a little bit, but God used it for his good. But Joseph made up his mind. When she approached him and grabbed his coat, he knew what he had to do. He had to get out of there. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 12 says this, Though a sinner do evil a hundred times, and his day, days be prolonged, yet surely I know that it shall be well with them that fear God, which fear before him. What do we value? Joseph knew. Luke 12, 34. I'm going to start this, and you're going to automatically know the rest of this. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know that one. If you treasure riches, that's what you're going to be chasing. If you treasure and value your marriage, then that's going to come before everything else. And that's what you're going to work on. If you treasure Bible knowledge and being pleasing to God, then that's what you're going to be chasing. It's easy. You make up your mind what you value, and that's what comes after. Priorities in the right order and set with God in mind lead to developing a woman after God's own heart. Number three, poised for purity. Poised for purity. It's uh, it can be difficult. I'll I'll agree. I didn't have a daughter. I I think I know how I would have. Um, my mindset, my philosophy about child rearing. About I think I know how uh, how that would have gone had I had a daughter. Uh, boys and girls are really different in that aspect. 
Um, I've watched friends raised successfully. Good Christian girls, I know it can be done. And I raised two Christian boys. It can be tough, especially in the USA. We're all around us are people just set on pleasing themselves and getting gain. And if it feels good, do it. We live in an oversexed society. It's, it's everywhere. It's in the clothing. It's on television. It's in the games. It's in books. It's, it's ridiculous. Modesty is laughable these days. There's a good um, bathing suit uh, company named Modilly, and not to advertise for them, but they make modest swimwear that you could wear at the beach or um, at the lake or anywhere you were going to get wet. They have um, skirts on them, and some, some of them have leggings under them, and there's just different styles. And I saw that on Facebook, and I looked into the um, advertisement itself, but what bothered me that is after, uh, of, of 750 comments, there were 300, and the emoji was laughing. They were looking at that as swimwear, and they thought, that's ridiculous. Who would cover up like that? And that's what they were saying. So modesty these days and people who try to be modesty are going to be people that, that laugh. But for a Christian, immodest dress is not a fashion problem. It's a heart problem. It's a heart problem. It's how you see what God's commanded you to act and conduct yourself as a young lady or an older lady. I mean, can we talk just a minute? Leggings, I love them, and I have several in several different shades and colors. They are not pants. Repeat after me. Leggings are not pants. They are to be worn under something as long as a short dress or um, in, in pajamas. They are not pants. Uh, some of you have some cleavage up here that are more well endowed than as am I. It needs to be covered up. Um, in one congregation that we attended, we had two men, a younger man and an elderly man, that stopped um, passing out communion because of seeing this when they were giving out communion. That's pitiful. That needs to be covered up. No matter how big or small, it can all be covered up. I am just mortified on a daily basis of what I see on Facebook, but it is especially distressing when I see people, Christians, that I know, Christians, mamas and daddies, they're all at the beach, they take the picture in the two-piece or the one-piece, doesn't matter, it's all, it's immodest, and they put it on Facebook. I don't understand that. Here's me, here's me, I have a heart problem, that's what the sign should say. I'm not doing, I'm not doing what God would have me to do right now, and here I am. And the familiarity between the sexes is just, it's all, I, I, we won't ever get it back in the bottle. But if you say, I can't be a Christian girl or boy in today, or I can't raise Christian girls and boys, you are so wrong. Joseph did it, and many others did it. You just have to decide where your priorities are and that you're going to be pure, poised for purity. God hasn't changed. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 says, Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God of great price. We should teach our children Honey, you are different. Teach them. Like, we don't, we don't want our little darlings and little precious to ever feel left out. But there are going to be times when they should. Living in our society, your children should be left out of some things, and you should make sure they're left out. But, Mom, I don't want to be different. You should teach them what 1 Peter 2, 5 says, Ye also, as lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. You know something? The world wants you. The world wants your marriage. And the world wants the lives of your children straight up. That's what the world wants. 
And if you don't fight for them, the world will. The world will win. As parents, it uh, those are crazy years when we're we're managing all of that stuff and all the people coming in and out and all the outside influences. People that have more influence over our children than we do. We never thought that possible. The person that they will marry, so important. But when those things come, I mean, there are times when no needs to be said, and God gave that child, you and your spouse, to be the ones to say no. That crazy child doesn't know that how dangerous that is and how that affects them in a bad, evil way. But you do. So say it. Say no. No, you can't go. And anything else that comes out of their mouth, go to your room. That's the way it is. I don't want to hear it. Um, do you force your children? I was drugged as a child. My parents drugged me. They drugged me to church, and they drugged me to Bible study, and they drugged me anywhere else that they thought that I ought to have to go, and I went. Now I know it was the best thing for me. Then, maybe not so much, I was still there. It's sort of like God gives you parents so they can, like, be with you and protect you while you're crazy, and then maybe one day you won't be crazy anymore. I don't know. Maybe that's my simple way of looking at it. Forcing church attendance. Well, I don't, I've heard people say, I don't, I don't really want to force them to go to church. Oh, really? Do you force them to go to school? Do you force them not to break the law? You force them to do a lot of things. You're talking about their spirit, where they end up in eternity. Yeah. You're going to church. You are going to go to church every time the doors open with me. And you're going to all the youth activities. And I'm going to insist that you dress appropriately and that you act appropriately. I am. And I'm also going to keep you away from certain people or places that I see as harmful to your spiritual life. Oh, yeah. I'm going to keep you away from those. It's it's what you do. Do you want their wedding night to be the first time? Well, it's possible. It's still possible. So people say, oh, no, no, no. See, that's what kids do today, and I'm just going to fix it so that they don't have to have consequences from their behavior. Oh, no, it's it's still possible for that to be the way. That's God's way. There's a story of a little short-tailed weasel that lives in the icy tundra that I thought was perfect for this um, section on purity. Um, he's called the ermine. And an ermine, like a little weasel about this big from the pictures that I could find of him, he's completely white because he lives in the icy tundra, and that's his cover, so he looks like the ice, so he's completely white, has this beautiful, beautiful coat. You think minks are pretty? This ermine, he's got a beautiful white coat. They say they live to be about four to six years old. And they burrow a hole in the ground. So that's where they live. So in the icy tundra, they're burrowing a hole. And that's where they get away from dangers. And um, their fur, as you can imagine, is very rare and very expensive. And being a small creature, it takes a lot of fur to, to make anything. Let me tell you something that the hunters figured out. They're They're fast and they're tricky and they go down into their hole. They're hard to catch. And so the hunters... They learn something about watching the ermine. They're constantly bathing themselves and keeping their coat spotless. So the hunters, they find where they live down in these burrows, and they put grease around the hole. And they just sop this black grease all around where the ermine would have to go through it in order to get into their hole. And they say that when the dogs get after the ermine, chasing the ermine, and he runs to the hole, that he sees that grease, and he literally turns and would rather face the dogs than to soil his beautiful white coat. And I thought, how appropriate that is for this section on purity. What soils our coats in 2020? Um, We have this blight of pornography on on our society. That that soils our coats. I remember when I was a little girl, um, I never saw any of it, but I knew that adults had to get get in the car, drive to the seedy part of town, get out at the right um, store or shop, walk to the back of the store, and there on the top shelf were the things that kids were not allowed to see. Pornography. Now, click of a mouse. Just a, just a button on the phone, just a Google. 
Dressing like the world has become something to soil our coats. If you can't tell the difference in a Christian and a worldly person walking down the street, the Christian needs to make a change. Soap operas. I used to think, there's no harm in that. I, I planned my college um, classes, my labs in the afternoon over what around what Luke and Laura, Luke and Laura were doing on General Hospital. Oh yeah, I did it. And I said to the older ladies, "There's that's that's not harmful. There's no harm in that." And there is. There's harm in that because that's not real life, and that teaches you to want something that you're not going to be able to get. That's not real life. Not good. Moms not keeping their homes. You don't have to stay home 24 hours a day in order to keep that home. I know that from reality. I've been a stay-at-home mom. I've been a missionary. I've been a teacher. And so I know you can do them both. But moms not keeping up, keeping their homes and keeping up with what's going on in their homes. Technology can soil our coats in 2020. Parents not spending time with their children. There's alcohol and drug abuse, extramarital affairs. Instead of turning and facing Satan and fighting him, we just soil our coats because everybody's doing it. Mary was chosen because she had kept herself pure. She, she, The mother of Jesus, Mary, she was already being what she needed to be before she knew what she was going to be called upon to do. She was already doing it. Matthew fifteen eighteen and 19 says, But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. And in Philippians 4, 8, it tells us the things we should think on. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, Whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. God tells us what he wants. And purity is one of them. As a young lady, as an older lady, we need to keep ourselves pure. First Timothy 5.22 says, Lay hands suddenly on no man, neither be a partaker of other man's sins. Here's the warning. Keep thyself pure. Pure. And it is something that we can still do in 2020 and teach our children how to do this. Because, you know, the ways in which we keep ourselves pure and our children says whether or not we have a heart for God. Number four, patient parenting. And I'll tell you another way that you can tell if you're a woman after God's own heart is how we parent. I was the perfect mom. And then I had kids. In my pre-children fantasy, I popped out a bunch of children who were great sleepers and who never had diarrhea shooting out of the back of their diaper and up into their hair. And in my fantasy, all my children called me mom. And never mom. And my, never, my children were never going to pitch a fit in the mall or church or a funeral other people's kids did that, but not mine. Uh-uh. And before I had kids, I always knew that motherhood would fulfill me completely. But in reality, motherhood is just nuts. Been there, done that. And you mothers listening, you know. It's just a wonder that we get out and we can still dress ourselves. Sometimes I had to hide to eat my snack. Well, those little snacks that I like, they're too expensive for these guys They'll take anything. They eat anything. Cheerios, cheese toes, whatever. This parenting gig is not for sissies. Now, don't get me wrong. I love my kids. I'm glad they're grown. We, got, we all got out of it, and we live to tell about it. But parenting is hard. They have different personalities and different wants. And if you have more than one, so the, this one worked with the first one, why is this not working with the second one? You're raising tiny little babies into responsible Christian adults. And so for me, early on, I created this fantasy of what motherhood motherhood was supposed to look like. And when I couldn't live up to the fantasy, I laid in bed at night and I worried about all the ways that I felt inadequate to do that job. And then I realized I shouldn't be doing that and feeling bad because basically I'm not superwoman. And so... I, 
Instead, I started laying in bed and I started thinking about what I did accomplish that day. I kept everyone alive and no one was on a, on fire. And just maybe I might even get a shower tomorrow. Who knows? And that deserves credit. Sometimes we as mothers, especially of little kids, when so much attention has to go their way, we pile so much on, uh, guilt on ourselves because we're self-abusive freaks. And we need to stop and change our focus. We need to put a crown on and remind everybody who we are. I went to the dentist recently, and he said, you're going to need a crown. And I said, I know, right? That's what I've been saying. And after surviving throw-ups and buses and people going out of the house who don't need to, don't know how to stay out of the road and keeping everyone fed and loved, oh, yeah, we deserve some kudos for that. Parenting is hard. See, there's a difference in mom and dad. Differences besides the obvious. Mothers, most mothers know about dentist appointments and friends and loves and hopes, and dreams, and fears of all their children. Dads, they're vaguely aware of some short people that live in the house somewhere. They're just not ever really sure what's going on. Mom manages all that, and she does it quite well. But God always told, told us that children should be disciplined and taught his way. There are many, many scriptures that refer to discipline and corporal punishment which is not the same thing as discipline. It can be different. Discipline. Our society has gotten away from this, and it's like a dirty word today to talk about discipline. Discipline simply means guiding children or people in the way they should go. The military, in the military, you learn discipline, how to do things in a certain way together. Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way that he should go, not the way he wants to go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, I've heard people teach this. There's a really wrong way to, to interpret this, and there's some other ways that are better. It does not mean, what it does not mean, Proverbs 22, 6 does not teach that if you take this kid by the ear and you drag him to church for 18 years, then as long as he lives, he will never leave church. That's not what that means, because obviously we've all seen that happen in a bad way. We don't we don't want that ending. That can't be what it means. What it does mean is that it's a principle. It's not a promise. It's a principle. Train up a child in the way he should go, should go, keep him on the straight and narrow, not the way he wants to go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. In those days, when the Bible was written, it, the train meant children about ages 16 to 23, teaching them a vocation that they can use and benefit from their whole life. This is between the ages is where Jesus learned to be a carpenter from his father.
But on occasions, there are times when our child might do something defiant. You've drawn a line in the sand. He flops his big hairy toe over the line. And when that child, for example, defiantly tells you, you shut up or I will not. I'll tell you something. It is not the time for a timeout. I understand that's big in preschools and a lot of the younger moms that I am watching. It's not time for a timeout when you're told to shut up or or you're told, no, I'm not doing that. It's not time for a timeout. It's not the time to wait on poor old dad who comes plodding in from work at 530 just to handle all the problems of the day. He's thrown his toe over the line you drew, and it is time for an old-fashioned spanking. Proverbs 23, 13, and 14 says, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. And then it repeats it. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shall deliver his soul from hell. Um, When my younger son was born, we called him Little Hitler. Because it was going to be his way, the only way, the child got spankings after spankings after spankings every day, beginning with about 12 months. I conquered him by about age three, and today, if you know my younger son, you can't make him mad. He's an easygoing guy who has a um, good personality, gets along with people, does not have a temper. He, we called him Little Hitler. Later, he was Mr. Ford because he always had a better idea about how to do everything. You know, you've just got to, everybody is born with these kinds of qualities, these characteristics, and if you can usher them in the right way, they can serve them well as an adult. Um, but I see a lot of kids running the homes today, especially a lifelong teacher of different age groups, even of college. I see kids running the home. And it's sad. And it's why we've got so much chaos in our families and in our society today. Nobody wants to upset Junior. Let's just let him do this. And he just, I just don't want to deal with it. Oh yeah, I want to deal with it. Because there's a bigger thing at play here. It's about disrespect. I hear that. I've even had to call down, picture this now, the principal and the four teachers that the child has. The child's there and the mother's there and the child is disrespectful to the parent. I've had to speak up and say, uh, watch what you're saying to your mother. I hope she backhands you when you get home. I mean, I've had to say that in a conference. That's not the home I grew up in. There's too much... Phone time, computer time, tablet time, game time, and not enough Bible time and and work ethic that we're teaching. Parenting has changed a lot in 2020 than when I raised mine in the 80s and 90s and and when I was growing up in the 60s and 70s. But we still should have the same goal in mind, getting these children to heaven, learning about the authority of God from the authority that's put in your home. Don't relinquish that authority. That is your opportunity. It's why you were, you're the parents is to say there are some rules that you have to go by and you will always have a boss or someone. If they don't learn authority from your home, how are they going to learn authority from a God they can't see? And let me tell you something. I've Since 2010, I stepped into the role of grandparents. I'm Gemma to six of the most beautiful grandchildren you have ever seen in your life. And if you're a grandmother like me, I know you think yours are cuter. That's We can discuss that at another time. Let me tell you something. If you haven't already figured this out, or if you're not a grandparent yet, I'm going to give you a good piece of advice that works for me. Don't ever, ever defy or go against the grandparents. The, the parents. If you're the grandparent, don't. Don't go against what the parents have said. You might hear what they've laid down as the rule or what the child can and cannot do, and you might think in your in your mind, you might think, that is the silliest thing I have ever heard anybody say. You, It, it might be, okay? But they said it, and that's their child. And if you want them to trust those children with you and to have a good relationship all the lives of these grandchildren, Stick up for the parents. I'm telling you, those kids, you'll say, now don't tell. The first thing they do when the parents come in is they're going to run tail. Jimmy gave me that piece of candy you said I couldn't have. Mm, I'm eating it now. <clears throat> don't do not do that. If they said they can't have it, don't do it. That's being a good grandmother. 
Um, but talking about how our society's changed and how much you being a woman after God's own heart deals with being a good godly parent, think about history and how we got to where we are today. I guess this is a simple way for me looking at it, but I think these are, are watershed moments for our society. Okay, so Charles Darwin, way back in the day, um, went on a trip and observed animals, and they were all, they all had similar characteristics. So Charles Darwin said we came from animals. Okay, long about the middle of the last century, Sigmund Freud, a psychologist who studied children, said it's okay to act like the animals that we are. And then more recently, in 70s, 80s, Dr. Benjamin Spock came along, and he said we shouldn't be punished for acting like the animals that we are. Okay, so let's go over that again. Charles Darwin says we came from animals. Sigmund Freud says we shouldn't be, that we, it's okay to act like animals that we are. And, Sig, and Benjamin Spock says that we shouldn't be punished for acting like the animals that we are. And consequently, we have raised the most violent generation in our nation's history. Things that kids are doing today, we never even dreamed possible. Children don't behave. We give them a pill instead of a spanking. And what happens is it leaves the parents crying instead of the kids crying. Times have changed, but there's still a few things that Junior needs to learn from Mama. And mo one of the most important things that we will ever teach our children, it's, it's even up there more than how to behave and which clothes match and how to talk and use good manners. And the most important thing that we'll do as a parent is to show our children what God expects from us in worship. Um, if we don't have goals for worship, sometimes I'm afraid it's all about keeping the child quiet and still. And we're missing a huge opportunity to teach our kids how to worship. Has your child ever thrown a Mickey Mouse doll five rows back in the middle of worship? Mine has. And I was so embarrassed that I wanted the pews to separate and the earth to open up and swallow me. And if that's ever happened to you, I bet you notice some of the glares, some of the well-meaning brethren and sisterin that looked around to tell you, as if you didn't already know, that your child should be quiet. I get it. The people that wished your child would stop making noise or moving or breathing. Now, should this happen to a young mom that's sitting in the area where you are with the baby, just pick the toy up and give it back to her with a smile. For the hand that threw that toy is the hand of a future deacon or elder or preacher or a gospel, uh, godly wife. Make sure that later when church is over that you tell her that you realize that babies are the church of tomorrow and that you are glad that she and her child are there. We want people bringing babies to worship. Now, parents, having a heart for God, being a woman after God's own heart, means that you're going to try and transfer what you know, hopefully, about what God requires in worship, and you're going to try to transfer that to your child. Worship is difficult for all of us. I think that what God's given us to do in worship is one of the most difficult things He's given to us. We're supposed to, during the communion, be keeping our mind on the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice and what He did for us. Many times it, it goes to, did I leave the oven on? Oh, I need to stop by. I mean, our mind just wanders. We've got to keep it on what we're supposed to be doing. It's difficult. First of all, you've got to set a good example and prepare that child. I mean... I, I know, I get it. I've been in, I've had two boys that I had to wrestle myself while their daddy was preaching. But my answer when, Mama, Mama, shh, Mama is worshiping. Don't talk to me. That's, that's kind of an answer that I would give. But then when we got away, I would also train them at home. I was thinking, now listen, we're going to church tomorrow and we're going to worship. And Mommy is going to worship and think about God. Don't be talking to me while I've got my eyes closed. When they pass the communion, you can't have any. Don't talk to me. Don't tell me to get your Cheerios out. Don't talk to me while the preacher is preaching. And so eventually it comes over, I hope, as, oh, we're in worship. Something important is going on here. 
And that's what I was trying to get across to that two, three, four, five-year-old child. With the younger one, we went out so much during those years, not really sure what was going on sometimes, but I was there. And he knew that we were always there. Um, and as a parent, you can involve the child and you can avoid disturbances like, why are you going to take a toy that makes noise? I found the closer that I sat up to the front, and I always sat close to the front, they can see their dad. They can see what's going on. When you hide out in the back, a lot of times they can only see the backs of people's heads, and they're not really engaged that something's going on. And follow through. If you say if, then, then you need to do it when you get home. I always had something that helped me, and as I was trying to shape those boys into mature Christian um, adults, young men, I would always think, and, and then here they are, this little boy, you know, I'm changing his diaper and spanking, and I would think, okay, I'm in church. What do I want to look like when he's 18? And when they're three, you just can't even imagine them being 18 and going off to college. But so do I, I need to prepare for it now. Do I want them as an 18-year-old teenager being sitting up with the youth group on the first five rows playing on their phone during church? Well, if I want that, then hand them your phone during, when they're three and tell them they can play with it. We're in church. Yeah, just be quiet. Do I want them to uh, slouch down in the seat and look all cool and put their leg across their other one and not sing? Let them do that when they're little. When they are able to stand up, then they should stand up when we sing. When they're able to hold a songbook, they should hold a songbook and stand up. When they can start reading, then they should stand up, hold a songbook, and read along. That's training. It doesn't happen one day. Okay, today we're going to do what we're supposed to do when we're singing. No, it, it happens little by little. There's this little window of opportunity to train these little ones in worship. And if you miss it, you miss it. Working moms, Proverbs 31 woman worked. There's a lot of things in Proverbs 31 that says she bought a field and she sold this and that and she went to the the she made things she sold it she bought and sold a field and we're keepers at home it says in Titus 2 2 5 I also know as a home mom meaning those years when I stayed at home and I didn't have a secular job just because I wasn't working a 40-hour job away from home didn't mean that I was disciplining and training as I should have been. You know, Lydia in Acts 16, 14, and 15, you can be hospitable just like Lydia. She, it, the Bible says she constrained Paul. She was a busy Christian merchant, but she didn't let that stop her from being part of that nucleus that was the church there in that city. I hope my boys always remember, I know they do some, but all of the great gospel preachers and the great soldiers of Christ that we have had at our table over the years. Another way that I was influencing them to not only be hospitable, but to, this is the kind of people I wanted them around. And um, I, I looked for opportunities to do that. Think about Lois and Eunice and look at what influence that you have. That's all that counts. Being the parent that our children need to help them get from earth to heaven one day is the way to be a woman after God's own heart. Number five is a big one. Proper speech. Sometimes, have you ever been this way, like somebody has come up to you at a party or get together or school or church, and they just, they just talk, they're doing all the talking. And it may or may not have anything that you're interested in, but Maybe I shouldn't admit this, but have you ever been listening to someone talk at you and you're thinking in your head, I'm listening to you speak, but in my mind, I'm pecking you to death. Yeah, sometimes. And we're going to talk about speech and I, I've ridden my own toes in this lesson, so I might step on a few, but it's something we need to think about. You know, I can usually control my mouth, but it's this face that gives it away, keeps me in trouble. In Matthew 26, verse 73, I found this recently, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to remember that for myself. When Peter was around the fire, and they were saying, hey, you're with that Jesus that's on trial in there, and it's going to be crucified. He's like, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And so one of them in Matthew 26, 73 said, 
Yeah, you're from you you're with him, thy speech betrayeth thee. I think they were saying your accent, the way that you're talking, I know that you came from that area. But that's a big one. Does our speech betray us sometimes? And say, it says maybe that we're not the Christian that we ought to be. We're not we don't have the heart for God that we should. Our speech is telling on us. Sometimes what comes out of our mouth gives it away that we don't have a heart for God. You know, remember that old well, if you're my age, I know you do, but if you're much younger, you might not have ever heard of Hee Haw, but it was a show uh, with a lot of country folks on it and a lot of music and funny, little short clip funny. Uh, they say that it was a joke and it wasn't going to last very long, but it turned out to be like this classic thing that's still in reruns. Grandpa Jones, who didn't do much on the show but sing occasionally and give the dinner report, but Grandpa Jones said one time, an ounce of shut up is equal to a pound of, I wish I hadn't said that. And in his hee-haw wisdom, that is a pretty good thing to remember. We women are emotional creatures. And the fact that we are understanders, men are fixers. They just, just give me the problem, I'm going to fix it right now, today. We're understanders. We want to understand a situation. And we usually arrive at our conclusions about somebody through trying to understand and so through that and us understanding and being emotional on top of that it leads to what's become known as gossip and women have the reputation that we gossip we gossip about people and sometimes we repeat things that we shouldn't well several years ago i don't know where i got it from but i came up with this acronym that someone shared and it's t-h-i-n-k and if i can Think about my friends here, we're riding in the car, and I think about something I want to say to her. If I run down the T-H-I-N-K, that usually tells me that this is a good thing to tell her, and I, I can go on with it. If I fail at any one of those five letters, then I stop right there, and I don't say it. And that has really helped me over the years. I'm going to share it in hopes that it might help you. So if you think about something you're going to tell. So T is for true. Is it true? Well, of course it's true. We're not going to tell something that's untrue. H, is it helpful? Hmm. Okay, well, maybe we can get by helpful because um, I'm going to tell you this, and maybe you can send her cards and and pray for her too and let her know, you know, so I'm going to tell you about it. So it's true and it's helpful. Let's go to the I. Does it pass the I test? I, is it inspiring? Hmm. Maybe what I was about to say to her, it's true and helpful, but it's not inspiring. N is for necessary. Is it necessary that I tell her this? Probably not. Then we get to the K, kind. Is it kind? Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? If it's, is it kind? If what you're about to say can pass the think test, go ahead and say it. Go ahead and say it. Everybody needs to hear it. If not, if it fails in one or more of those, just keep it to yourself and you won't be caught gossiping and your speech won't betray you. Proverbs 17, 28 says, Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. We all know that Abraham Lincoln read the Bible every day, the writings say, and he said, I bet he was reading Proverbs 17, 28, he said, It's better to be silent and thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. And I think that really holds true. Sometimes we just don't need to say it. Now, I saved this kind of speech for this section all to its own. Everything I've said is true about the things that we can say or not say, but there's something called euphemisms that are really used a lot in our society. And if you're not on guard, if it's it can just become a habit that you're using these words. So I just want to take this just a few minutes here and think about some of the euphemisms that we might throw around. Now, this ta this particular topic, euphemisms, have always been a struggle for me because I grew up in the Deep South, and I have a grandmother who has more f metaphors and analogies that you can imagine. She'd say things like, oh, he's as annoying as a hare in a biscuit. I'd fight a circle saw for him. I would think, and and my mother, my grandmother told my mother when she was little one time, and my mother passed it on to me. She said, if you don't do that, I am going to beat you until your behind won't hold shucks. I thought, 
what is a shuck and why is my behind not going to be able to to hold them? I had no idea. She was talking about corn shucks in a basket that had big holes in it. It was a large basket that held all the corn shucks. Anyway, that's the Deep South for you. We say a lot of crazy things, and you don't really understand sayings from the Deep South until, unless you came from there or you live there. There are no more religious group of people than the women in the Deep South. But unfortunately, this is where we get some of these things from. OMG in texting. That's, that's become a thing in texting with emojis. And we all know what that means. But a woman after God's own heart will realize that our speech gives away what's in our heart. Oh, our heart up here. It gives away what's up here. And even if we really, you say, Jeannie, it does not. That is not in my heart. No bad things are in our heart. Well, you're giving that impression, I think. And so hear me out. I just want to delve into these euphemisms a little bit. The third commandment says, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And that's in two places, Exodus 20, verse 7, and Deuteronomy 5, 11. Now, when I read this as a child growing up, and you're at, at church and don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. I don't know why, but I always thought that meant cursing or swearing. So I never did that. So I'm good. Third, third commandment, check that off. But at the same time, I think I was doing other things that take after the real definition of vain. Vain, the definition of vain is not cursing. That's, that's a subject all to its own. I looked up the definition of vain when I sat down and studied this, and in vain literally means to use God's name in an empty or trifling way without appropriate reverence. It doesn't mean cursing at all. It just means using God's name or a derivative of God's name in a way that is not reverent. You're not using it in a way that's talking about the Almighty God. So in our modern world today, you know, you can just be in a store and hear things. People shouting God and Jesus Christ, and they have nothing to do with the Savior and our Father. It's, it's in anger or contempt. You now, Mother always said, garbage in, garbage out. And if you're around people that do this, it is so easy to pick up this habit. Just, I'm... Um, I'm trying not to be uh, to come across as judgmental because I am like the opposite of judgmental. I'm saying let's look at this and just just think about it. Just try to be open to what I'm saying as a person who used to use some of these. So a euphemism is a word that you wouldn't say the direct word in this situation, but you're going to say another word that's kind of the same, and you're going to use it in its place. So. For God. Okay, so you're not, you're a Christian. You're not a, a, not a woman who's going to be out in public and just say, God, or oh God. But we might be saying, Gall, golly, gosh, gaddy, gads, by George, by Jove Almighty, and there's a hundred of them in the same situation. In the same token, you're not going to be one of those who in anger yells out Jesus Christ. You're just not going to do it. But then in the same situation, are we saying G's, G, she's, G whiz, cripes, jeepers, by jingo, Jesus, by Jesus, and everything else you can think of instead of saying Jesus. Just just say and think about it. Um, and then you're not going to say Jesus Christ or derivative thereof, so you might say the initials of Jesus Christ. Where do these see these words come from somewhere? So you're saying the initials, so JC is Jiminy Cricket, Jiminy Christmas, Jumping Catfish, Jeepers Creepers, and a million more. See what happens? And we're not saying the word, but we're saying something else. Is that showing that you're a woman after God's own heart to use the names of our Savior, and our Father in a trifling and vain way, as the Scripture said. Okay, so you're not going to yell out, Lordy, you know, that's that's big in the South. You know, we'll say, Lordy mercy. You know, we'll talk to God about, please help me not to kill this child that I'm spanking, you know. And so it's an innocent, it's even a funny, it's meant to be funny and to, and to show that you're exasperated, but should we? So instead of saying Lord, we say Lord and Lordy and thank you, Lordy and Lordy and things like that. Just say and think about it. 
And what about holy? Holy is a word that refers to God's nature or God's works or anything that God is present or involved in. That's that's where holy should be used. And any word, any use of this word put together with another word in any context outside its correct use is a violation of the third commandment, in my humble opinion. So, for instance, so you take holy and you say, holy smokes, holy cow, holy cannoli, and lots of other things that you've heard people say. Is that really what we should be saying? Why do we have to say anything? I'll admit, it's a terrible habit and it is a terrible habit to break. But it's what other people are hearing from you and maybe it turns their ear inside out like it does mine now. And the last one I think I'll do is the big one, condemning someone or damning someone. Now, we're not saying that. We're even taught as children. We don't know why, but we're not. That's a bad word. Don't say that. But we'll say darn and darn and dang and doggone and just a lot of other things like that. My point in bringing this up and talking about our speech, proper speech, being a woman after God's own heart, is to just check on that. Maybe we need just to check up. Maybe we need to think about, you know, I do say those things. Maybe other people do think something is wrong or something's bad. Since I'm using those, maybe I can just call those out a little at a time. Something to think about. Just think and be careful. We want to be a woman after God's own heart. Are words important to God? Oh, yeah, they are. Jesus Christ said, But I say unto you that for every idle word men may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Matthew 12, 36 and 7. Right there it is. That scares me. I've got to make sure that what comes out of here is what ought to be coming out here. I believe that euphemisms are inappropriate for a Christian and they're a difficult habit to break. They really are. Ephesians 4.29 says, Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification. That's why we were given the ability to speak, to communicate with others, to teach them the gospel, to encourage and uplift our brothers and sisters. As lights in a dark world, we're to set an example, not only of our conduct, but in our speech as well. Colossians 4, 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer every man. The salt is a preservative. It's where we get our word salary. And in Leviticus 2, verse 13, there were salt sacrifices. Salt preserves. We're told in Matthew 5, 13 and following, Ye are the salt of the earth. But if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is since worth good for nothing than to be cast out and trodden under the feet of men. You are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill cannot be hid, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but upon a candlestick, and it giveth light to all the house. Therefore let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and may glorify your Father. And so as you think about salt, it really has a couple of lessons for us. Back in that day, people were paid with a bag of salt. It was very rare. And somebody noticed that the brown salt was the same color as the brown sand. When we lived in Tanzania, the sugar was brown. It didn't have all the purifying elements in the process that we have over here, so it was brown. It looked like sand. It looked kind of weird. We Something to get used to. But someone noticed that the salt in the bag that they were paid was the same color as the sand. So they just thought, hmm, I'll just mix this with a little sand, and then it'll go further. I'll have more buying power. And then the next person did it, and the next person did it, and pretty soon all you have is a bag of sand. Just throw it out in the road. If we cut ourselves with a little world here, little language here, little dress there, before long we don't, we don't even resemble or taste like the Christian that we're supposed to be. Titus 2.8 says, Sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. In other words, if you live in such a way that when people hear gossip and untrue things about you, they say, no, that's not true. I know her. I have a sign over my back door, and it goes like this. Let those who do not know God come to know God because they know me. And that says a lot about how I'm supposed to conduct myself as a Christian. There's a, some ways that we can not do that. The anger, having an ang- losing your temper. Um, I've heard people say, well, that's just the way I am. 
My mother was hot headed, and so am I. I might be wrong, but I think God expects more of us than to take a bad habit or something we just like to do that's easy to do and ride it all the way to the judgment. I think we're going to be surprised when we get there. I think he expects us to get a little better at things, don't you? When you walk away after giving someone a piece of your mind, would they say that you're a woman after God's own heart? And I know some people that have given away a piece of their mind so many times they don't even have a piece, they don't even have a mind left. They've given it away a lot. They've given people a piece of their mind. Our words are meant to encourage others and to teach others. Do we use our lips to encourage and build them up or teach them the gospel as it says in 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9? Do we use our lips to discourage others? You know, it's really, that's the easiest thing to do. You know how to, dis, the easiest way to discourage somebody? Just don't say anything. Somebody goes out of their way to teach a lesson, plan a Saturday women's study, do a ladies class, have a ladies night out. Just don't say anything. Just don't acknowledge all the, the trouble that they went to and just don't say anything. That's discouraging. And sometimes we are, well, maybe people didn't really want to do that. Make sure you encourage people that go out of their way, step out of their comfort zone. In Hebrews thirteen fifteen, it talks about worship. We're to use our uh, lips in worship, offering God the fruit of our lips. What an obvious difference it is. When we are worshiping God on Sunday with these lips, the same lips that discouraged and used God's name in vain last week. Not supposed to be happening. Just be careful. Are we the type of woman that others know that it's a pretty good chance that we'll know the answer to their Bible question if they come to us? Hey, who was, what was the name of Hagar's son? Not that you have to know everything, but what's your response? Do they know that they can come to you and get an answer? Or is it, well, what do you think I am, a Bible dictionary? That's using your lips in the way that, not in the way that God would have you do it. How about, are you approachable? Are you known as a woman that's approachable? If I have something against you, then I know without a shadow of a doubt, I'm nervous, and I really don't want to come to you and say this, but the Bible tells me to. Are you going to blow a gasket? Or are you the kind of woman that I know that you're going to hear me out? Even if even if I want to apologize to you, or if I come to you and I say you've done something to me, and I just want to clear the air. I think that we should be. That speech that's pleasing to God, that encourages and uplifts others, that's a way to tell that we're a woman after God's own heart. Number six, prepared to repent. You know, we can't separate repent and forgive. We just can't. Because when someone repents, there needs to be forgiveness. And when someone asks for forgiveness, there's repentance. It you can't separate them. They're both necessary if we want to be women after God's own heart. And they're difficult. And everyone is different as to which one of those two things is the most difficult. But I know they are difficult. Every time someone repents, someone else must forgive. And vice versa. So let's look at Luke chapter 15, verse 11, for my favorite place to go when we want to learn about repentance and forgiveness and just kind of shore that up or or share, share situations. You know, if we'll just do things God, God's way, he's laid it down for us, but so many times we don't want to do it. In Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 32, we call it the prodigal son because the son went away from the protective house where the father was. And so we all know later that the father in the story is representative of God, and the father in the story raised and protected his boys through childhood. He was a good father, a godly father from everything we can tell. He wanted them to stay there in that house all their years and commune with him. And he also had material things saved up for his boys' futures. He guided them in the ways of righteousness. It looks like to me that he was being a great father. But even great parents can have a rebellious child, and it's not their fault. And in this story, one son chose to leave that home that the father had prepared for him. So after instructing his children, the father gave them the free will. He didn't try to stop Junior from taking his money and walking away. 
I don't think he could have if he wanted to, because he had the world by a string on a downhill pull. There was nothing you could have said to turn him back. He was leaving. He essentially came to the father and said, I know I've got an inheritance coming, and I want it now, so I kind of wish you were dead already so I could have my money and go have fun. But that father, he didn't hold it against the child, and he waited every single day for him to return. I imagine him looking down the road at least a couple of times a day looking for him to come back. The second person in that story is the son, and this represents a child of God who is erred. He was faithful. He's faithful as long as he was at home. I personally believe that this is a requirement for a man who wants to be an elder. It says in Titus 1, 6, If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of right or unruly. These are not, an elder must have faithful children who are grown. And, have, and can make their own decisions. What decision can a child make? Are, are you faithful when you're 15? Children in my house were faithful because I made sure they were, but that had nothing to do with the state of their heart. And so this son was faithful as long as he was at home, but get away from that protective home, and he had, he had some trouble. Apparently, he didn't see the big picture of life. See, serving our God is a lifestyle. It's not just a one and done. It's not something our parents do for us. It's a lifestyle. Like Joseph, who had already made up his mind. I already, I already know what I'm going to do in every situation because I'm going to please God first. Everything else comes after. But he didn't cherish his family like he should have. Was there a mother in the picture? I don't know. It just talks about the three characters but if there was a mother in a home like that, that mother missed her son just as much. You see, when one leaves the fold of safety, and you know we're talking about leaving the fold of God, it hurts everyone. It especially hurts your physical family, but it hurts everyone. It's selfish, and it's self-centered, and it's prideful. It's taking God off the throne and saying, I know what your word says, but I got it. I've got this. He left home with a pocket full of money, and he was going to have fun. He he took that money out. He waved it around, and he wanted everything, and he wasted all of it, and then he was in want. If you read uh, Luke 15, 13 through 17, one particular phrase stands out at me. When he was sitting in that pig pen, and the Bible says that even the slop and the stuff that the pigs were going to eat looked good to that little Jewish boy, the Bible says, and when he came to himself. So you got to come to yourself. You're not yourself in the foreign country. you got to get up and decide, I'm not myself. I'm going home. Can you imagine how he looked? Because he ran out of money. It's not like he could buy clothes. And the only job that he could find was feeding the pigs, which he was not supposed to touch. Can you imagine how he smelled? But he repented. He took action. He asked for forgiveness. He went home and fell on his father, and he begged for his forgiveness, and he offered to become just like one of the hired servants. i tell you what he didn't do. He didn't use his keys and just sneak in one night, and then the next day he ends up out in the field like, hey, what's up? You know, nothing happened. No, he didn't do that. He humbled himself in the form of a servant, and he was fully, fully restored in the house of his father. His father was so glad to have him back into the protective fold of safety. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. See, that's the action from God the Father to the son who repented. Well, then there's this third character that sometimes, if we're being honest, that we as members of the church sometimes can act like. And it causes a problem. He was faithful to his father all of his years, or was he? He stood to inherit everything his father had. So if a father had two sons in those days, so they added a third, a third part, and the father's inheritance was divided into three parts for the two sons. The older son got two-thirds, and the younger son got one-third. So that son had already gotten what was his. So this older son that was home stood to inherit everything else. He had worked hard for his father. And, you know, to his credit, at dinner every night, he probably looked across the table at his father, who was very sad from the brother being gone. Did that make him angry 
that his younger brother had been so frivolous and just walked off, and now his father was sad. This brother had continually, faithfully, every day worked for his father up until this episode. He was working out in the fields. Frankly, when the younger son came home, he didn't even know there was a party. The servants had to tell him that his brother had returned. And verse 28 of Luke 15 says, And he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and entreated him. And he answering said unto his father, now listen to all the personal pronouns of I, me, my into this all of a sudden. And answering said to his father, Lo, these many years I served thee, neither transgressed I at any time thy commandment, and yet thou never gavest me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. Hmm. We got a bad attitude all of a sudden. Was he serving faithfully, or was it just because he didn't have anything to be unfaithful about. A little holier than thou is what it sounds like to me. Kind of like Jonah, who didn't feel that those people were worthy of taking the gospel to. The Jews were portrayed here by this older brother because they thought that they were better than the Gentiles. Jesus had to straighten them out on that. You know, the brother lied, I think, when he said he never transgressed. He didn't appreciate the graciousness of his father. The brother said, but as soon as this, thy son, he didn't say my brother or this person. He said, but as soon as this, thy son was come, which hath delivered thy living with harlots, thou hast killed for him a fatted calf. And envy eats up another one. First of all, he jumped to conclusions about what he had been doing. He had no knowledge about what he had been doing. He could guess, but... He jumped to conclusions, and he absolutely was displaying haughtiness for the son who had come back. You know, that's sort of like us. We don't have to be in the far country, so to speak, to sin. We can sin sitting in the church building. We sin when we don't treat our brethren right when they repent. We sin when we're secretly happy that our brethren who have repented have to suffer the consequences of what they've done. Something to think about. Learn to be kind, Ephesians 4.32. That's what we need to do. Worry about our own red wagon. My mother said that many times when I would try to tell her something about my brother. You need to, li you need to take care of your own red wagon. Mm. We need to learn to confess our faults quickly, and we have them, James 5.16. And never doubt the genuineness of someone else's repentance. I tell you, it can make it easier to do if we think about loving that person almost as much as Christ loves us and overlook some of the things that we do. We need to listen when someone reads what the Bible says about how to make it right, and we're about to go through that, how to make something right, and they're trying to do it, so they come to you, are we going to listen to what they say, this problem's come up. Whether it's them or us, we need to listen. Whether it's a sin problem or it's just a personality conflict. James 1.19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. In other words, tune in, tone it down, and sweeten up. So let's talk about forgiveness and just get down to brass tacks, so to speak. Here's what God says, God's Word says about the matter. And I'm going to look in Matthew chapter 5. Um, and I think I'll find all of these in Matthew, I think. There's many. Matthew 5, verse 23 and 4 says, Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother has ought against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. But we won't do it. So we, we go to worship and we're offering our worship to God, our praise to God. He knows what's going on with us. We know that there's a brother or sister out there that's got something against us, whether we're right or wrong. And we just keep sitting there. We're not going to ever attend to it. We might say, but... But we won't do it. I'm not mad. I'm not mad. If, if somebody, your spouse, asks you about it, I'm not mad. I went to class. She, I sat by her. I am not mad. When all the time you know that things are not right between you and that person. 
What that verse says is if you find that something is between you and someone else, you need to clean that up first before you offer worship to God. It does not say when you go to the altar and you remember there that your brother has ought against thee, offer it anyway. It doesn't say that. It also doesn't say go across town and offer it at another altar. It doesn't say that either. God expects mature Christians to go to each other, clear up problems, and worship together. Truly worship with a pure heart. Okay, so that's if it's me. And I know it's me, and I've done something, or they think I've done something. That's a verse about clearing it up. Okay, turn over to Matthew 18, 15 through 17. And this is, what if it's them? All right, so Matthew 18, 15 says, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. Don't tell your sister. Don't tell the person you sit by. Don't gossip about it. Go to them and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, that happens sometimes. But God's Word tells us how to fix all these little problems. He knew that we would have trouble with relationships, and here it is. But we won't do that either. And so we have problems. We have people sitting in the pews on Sunday that don't speak to each other. Hmm. But Matthew seven twelve tells us about what if it's both. And it's kind of a general one, but I'll put Matthew seven twelve down. Therefore, all things, whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. If we all treated everyone the way we want to be treated, that would fix a lot of it right there. But we worry, oh, well, if I go to them, what will they say? Well, I think they'll just be mad about it. Oh, I, th I don't think they'll ever get over with it, so I just won't do it. Even though that's what God's word says about it. And when there's something between us and someone else, it's almost like there is a big, fat elephant in the room. And I found this that Terry Kittering read, and it's so appropriate for something like this. There's an elephant in the room. It is large and squatting, so it is hard to get around it. Yet we squeeze by with, how are you, and I'm fine, and a thousand other forms of trivial chatter. We talk about the weather, we talk about school, and we talk about everything else except the elephant in the room. There's an elephant in the room, and we know it's there. We're thinking about the elephant as we see each other and occasionally talk, and it's constantly on our minds. For you see, it is a very big elephant. It has hurt us all, but we do not talk about the elephant in the room. Oh, please, can we really talk again? Oh, please, can we laugh together as we once did? Oh, please, let's just talk about the elephant in the room. For if we talk about what drove us apart, perhaps we can talk about renewal, the renewal of two old friends. Can I say these things and not have you look away? For if I cannot, then you are leaving me alone in a room with an elephant. How can we spend eternity in heaven together if we can't spend a few hours a week with each other here? And the truth of the matter is, we won't. We won't spend eternity together because one or both of us is not being pleasing to God and we're not a woman after God's own heart, for sure. Being a woman with a heart of repentance and humbleness is a way to be a woman after God's own heart. So, I need to wrap this lesson up. In conclusion, so how about it? Who owns your heart? Who do we think about pleasing more than anybody else in the world? Do we possess these qualities? Are we daily, every day, it's on our mind, how would God want me to react? Am I being a woman that can be said after God's own heart? You know, if not, it just takes a little mental work. We have to decide just if, if any of these things has touched you in any way and you think, I need to make some changes there, then you just need to decide, okay, that is what I need to do. 
and I need to ask God for forgiveness or someone else, and I need to set a goal. This is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to drop off. And we set that course, and we make a plan, and we just work the plan. And sometimes we fail, and we just keep working the plan. Say, oops, and we get better and better at being that Christian woman that God wants us to be. So I guess at the end of this, we just have to decide, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to hear it and ignore it? You know, James 1.22 says, be a doer of the word and not a hearer only. Are we going to allow the feminist agenda that is so strong in 2020 to rob our family of the happiness that can be known in the peace of God, keep us out of heaven? Are we going to rearrange and constantly watch our priorities? For we know that whatever we value, that's what we're going to be chasing. Are we going to keep ourselves pure no matter what? Young girls that might be listening to this lesson, are you going to listen to your parents, to your mother and father when they say, that doesn't look appropriate, you need to go and change? Is it, oh, I'm sorry, yes, ma'am, or mother, you're so old-fashioned, everybody has this own. Your choice. Are you going to keep yourself pure no matter what? Are we going to treasure our life as a parent while we have those impressionable little people? Are we going to wish our life away because we're inconvenienced? Are we going to watch our speech as we go about daily trying to be a light in the world? Are we going to look at repentance that we just talked about in a biblical way and use it to, as the Bible says, seek peace and ensue it? 1 Peter 3.11, let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. What is it going to look like at the pearly gates? I think we should all look at, at our life like that. You know, we've got a final exam coming up. God's given us everything we need to know. We just need to study it and do it. What, what's that going to look like? Are we going to stand at the pearly gates? Are we going to stand before judgment? We're waiting in line. I don't even know what that looks like. What are our regrets going to be? I, I know I'm going to have a million. But I'm going to try and make sure that it's not pettiness. I don't want that to be a regret. I think I don't want it to be about I ran after material possessions more than I ran after doing what God wanted me to do and building up the church and teaching others. I want to look around and see that there's some people here that I taught the gospel. I don't want it to be about pettiness. I don't want it to be because you and I had a problem and I wouldn't go to you. You wouldn't come to me. That's silly. I know I don't want it to be that. And I have control over that. I'm alive. I can still do something about that. Heaven is the goal. Nothing else matters. Be a woman after God's own heart. And I'll leave you with this. Won't it be wonderful there, having no burdens to bear, joyously singing with heart bells all ringing. Oh, won't it be wonderful there? Thank you for listening. I challenge you to go out there and be a woman after God's own heart. Thanks.